Okay, this morning I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalm. We're going to be looking at chapter 63. While you're turning, the most significant struggle I have is between my ears. In other words, my mind, and even worse, my memory. It seems as though as I have gotten older, for whatever reason, the things that I remember are my mistakes and failures. A lot of times in relation with my children. It's not that I've committed felonies or what most would consider to be big sin, but I do and have sinned nonetheless. I tend to think like David now as I have gotten older also against you, talking about God, and you only have I sinned. Or as James wrote, if you fail at one point, you are guilty of it all. And the reason is because sin is sin. And I do feel like Paul many times as though I were the chief of sinners. Therefore, from my perspective, one of the absolute most amazing things, knowing what I know about me, and I would venture to say, if you think much through your own life, you would agree, it's pretty amazing that God loves me. Because I'm a sinner deserving of eternal damnation, but Jesus died and took on my sin and your sin and all of our sin for those who would believe and God punished him for it. I don't get that. It is hard for me to comprehend how and why God still loves me. You know why? It's because of what I'm like. And what every one of us is like to varying degrees with different people. You see, the reason that I say that is because when someone wounds or harms us, it's pretty easy for us to scratch them off our ticket. We can even cut them out of our life if it's severe enough. And when I fail others, whether great or small, whether I know it or all, I'm cut out of their life. Now, as I'm giving this, trust me, it'll, it'll, it'll come up. It'll, we'll, do, we'll be doing better here in a little bit. But has anybody ever cut you out of their life? Or have you and I cut people out of our lives? Because of things they have done? One of the things my dad told me when I was growing up, and I have perpetuated it to my children and now to my grandchildren, is dad used to tell me, the reason I love you is, my, is because you're my son. I don't care if you fail a class, well I do care, but if you fail a class, I'm your son, I'm your dad, I love you. If you rob a bank, if you kill somebody, he goes through a litany of things. He said, I still love you. That was the last time he and I ever talked about that. He told me he loved me a lot. But I translate, I, I, I morphed that a little bit, and I taught my kids, Pam and I did, is we would ask them, why, does, why do I love you? And they would immediately say, because I'm your child. And so that's what the idea of unconditional love is. I can remember doing several uh, marital counseling sessions and I would, I would always ask the groom first, put the, the potential future groom, why do you love her? And invariably he would say, because she's cute, she's sweet, she's funny, her dad's got money. <laughs> You know, he would go through all these different reasons as to why he loved her. I'd say, okay, the old lady was sitting there, 
you know, kind of feeling good about herself. And then I would ask him a question. What, what, what would you do if after y'all got married, one day she was in a wreck and you had to take care of her yourself 24 seven for the rest of her life and she lived for 44 years. Would you still love her? I'll never forget the first time it happened. The, groom, <laughs> the potential groom was like, and of course she looks at him like, well, <laughs> you know, because you see, if you love somebody because of, what do you do when that because of leaves or is taken or goes away? You love someone because you love them. That's why God loves us. It's certainly not because of how good looking we are or how healthy we are or how smart we are or how much stuff we've got. God loves us because he loves us, period. And so nothing can change God's love for us. But sadly, we're not like that. And I know I'm saying it because there are people you know, just by way of confession, I'm not going to go any further with it because it's not in God's business. <laughs> but there are people that it's hard for me to love. There's some people it's hard for me to even call on the phone, especially when they never answer anymore. Did you hear me? Anymore. And they never call me anymore just to check in. If you want to know who cares about you? It is who keeps up with you. That's why you've heard me say, I think before, I cannot stand it when people say, well, if you need anything, give me a call. That sounds great. But that means don't call me unless you need something. That's like I had a deacon one time. This was when Britain was sick down in, in Oxford, Alabama. Ooh, yeah, well, okay, it was in Oxford. And he told me, he said, Ron, I understand y'all are going, we were going to Cincinnati. He said, uh, he said I understand y'all were going to be out of town for about a week uh, with Britain up in Cincinnati. Uh, if there's anything I, yeah, I can do for you, let me know. I said, well, you could cut my grass till I get back. Is there anything else? <laughs> <laughs> it is fine. You know, it sounded good, but, but you know, we're kind of in a, a a uh, employer-employee relationship too many times. As long as somebody meets our expectations, did you hear that? Meets our expectations, then they're our buddies, they're our friends. And that's why so many times when mistakes are made or an offense happens, the relationships splinter. That's why churches that's why congregations, not churches, that's why congregations sometimes split. Because they don't understand the concept and the idea of forgiveness. You know, even Paul wrote that we are to forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. Yeah, but, you know, uh, you don't understand what they did. Don't care. To what degree have we uh, offended God? Well, we offended him to the point that we deserve eternal damnation. I don't think anybody's ever offended us to that degree. The point being is that we need to understand that, that the depth of God's love, we can't even get close to it. But yet still, I, I'm going to really step out there for a minute. Because I know it's none of us, okay? It's his meaning to none of us. But all them people that left, whoever they are, whenever they were, there are always people. How long, how long has this congregation been here, Joel? Since 1938. Since 1938. There have been people since 1939. We'll give them a year. That have left because of an offense with somebody else in the congregation and they never came back. That 
is not Christian. That that's the way we are. There are people that I have no longer uh, engaged with because of how they wounded me. And I am sure that I am so ignorant that I have wounded others and that's why they've cut me out of their lives. Now, Ron, why are you going through all that? Well, I'll tell you, it's because of what we're looking at here in, in Psalm chapter 63. And, and, and there's something that, that we need to be aware of because we're going to be, I'm, well, my goal this morning is to move us toward where God is with us, with each other. Okay, that's my goal. Now, here's why it is important. Now, just listen. You can jot down the reference if you would like, but I prefer you to listen because faith comes by hearing. Jesus is talking, and here's what he says in Matthew chapter 5 and beginning in verse 22 through 24. This is... You won't talk about huge and big. This is huge and big here. Matthew 5, 22, Jesus is the one speaking, and here's what he says. I say to you that everyone, how, how many is that? Everybody. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother, mm, that one kind of pinches. Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, let me just say, the idea and con concept of fool is you're worthless. I don't, you know, I, don't even just, I don't wish you didn't breathe the same oxygen that I breathe. That's what he's talking about here. So we're all really pretty much already lumped in this verse. But let's keep reading so we can get out of it. Verse 23, he says, So, Jesus still speaking, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you. Now notice where he's putting the context. It's not do you have something against your brother. It's if, is it that your brother has something against you. And listen to what Jesus says you're to do. Now, let's put it in the context of our worship service this morning, okay? Let's put it in the context of if you are in the, the process of worshiping God and you remember randomly by the prompting of the Holy Spirit that, that there is somebody that has something against you, here's what Jesus says. Leave your gift. There, before the altar, and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. You know what Jesus is saying here? Is that when we have broken relationships where somebody has something against us, it is, against us, it is so significant that it is worthy of interrupting worship. And going and making it right and not coming back until it is made right. Hmm. Jesus started meddling now, to be honest with you. And I hope y'all are all back with me next Sunday. I hope I'm back next Sunday. Because here's what Jesus is saying. Is that broken relationships are worth interrupting worship. We're to make things right and then come back and worship God. And, 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 and I want you to hear something with me. I told y'all, to. I asked y'all, I didn't tell you. I asked y'all to read a particular passage of scripture last Sunday. I don't know whether or not you did, but if you didn't, I'm going to now read it for you. Okay? Just jot it down. Listen to what is written. This comes from Isaiah chapter 1. God is the one speaking here. And, and here's my point. Is, is it important in how we treat others and how it affects worship and our relation and interaction with God? Is that important? Isaiah chapter 1 beginning in verse 11. God is speaking. 
What to me is this multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. But when you come to appear before me, in other words, when you come to worship, who is required of you this trampling of my course? Bring no more vain offerings, incense, and he's referring to prayer here. Incense, your prayer is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of invocations. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. That means that we have that we need to have our hearts right before we even come into the place of worshiping God. Otherwise, there's a barrier. Your new moons and appointed feasts, my soul hates. That's heavy. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Does it matter how we treat others and how we interact with people and whether or not we... And the thing that bothers me is, is that according to what we're reading here in Isaiah 11, they didn't even have a clue. They thought they were good. They were coming to worship. They were bringing the right sacrifice and they were praying and they were burning incense and God is saying, quit, quit. Because of the way you've been treating your brothers and your sisters and other people, I am sick of it. Does it say that he kicks them out? Does it say that God withdraws himself from them? He says, you need to get your life right. Listen to verse 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's case. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That's called revival and awakening. And that's something we all need to take seriously because God takes seriously, Jesus took seriously how we interact with others, our own attitude toward them, and their, yes, their attitude toward us. Now, does that mean that, that every, I'm going to tell you, I think if we really got serious about it, Every congregation in America today would have to say, we're going to pause and we're all going to go make things right. We'll come back next Sunday. I think that would have to take place probably across America. In the New Testament, I believe it's called quenching the spirit. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, 10. So we're all guilty here. But you know what is amazing? It's Psalm 63. His steadfast love endures forever. God still loves us. Do you think God knew what kind of people we were when he decided to love us? Did he know how dirty and dark and sinful we were and would be even after our conversion? Did he know that? Sure. And you know what? He still loves us. Psalm 63 and verse 1. Let's begin reading there a little bit. David writes, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life. Stop. Slow down. Do you see what he's saying here? Because your love is better than life. 
To, to this point, he has referenced God over and over and over and over. And he's talking about worship. He's talking about his daily thoughts. He's talking about how he longed to be with God. I mean, how many of us think about God every day, multiple, multiple, multiple times every day? Or is it something that, that we do just, just periodically throughout a week? And what David is saying here is he's talking about how he... He has a passionate desire to see God. Verse 2, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. And then he says in verse 3, because your steadfast love, I would interject for me. I, I like to make the scripture personal. Because your steadfast love for me is better than life, my lips will praise you when you know the hymn. I'm sorry, I just had to put that in there. I didn't know that last hymn. That's why I didn't sing. So, But he's saying here, he says, my lips will praise you. So I, I will tell you this, as I read and listened, I was praising God. Man, I may not have been anything coming out of my mouth, but there was praise and worship there. Look at, he said, look at what he says in verse four. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I'll lift up my hands. Now, that is David exposing the desire of his heart. And when I was reading this, I asked myself, is that me? Is that where I am? Do, do, I, do I have the same concept and desire of God that David has in verses one through four? Because if that's not my heart's desire, then that means that I have strayed somehow from God. You remember Hebrews 2, 1. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. It is a constant desire, but once you have seen, what is it? Uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you, get a, when you get a dose of God and his revelation and his love and his compassion, his forgiveness and his mercy and his goodness, and all those kind of things, I'm telling you, it will transform your life and it will transform how we conduct ourselves as we come in to worship and as we leave and throughout the week. It will happen. It will take place. As we move closer to living what we just read in verses 1 through 4, listen, the result will be contentment. It will be contentment. And, and to be honest with you, that's what everybody wants. Because by nature, humanity seeks contentment. But through nature, our sin nature is through things of the world, stuff the world can give us or present to us. I could go through and call them all out, but then I'd miss something that you need, you have. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, what is it that if you had that, you would be content. If you are not content, why? Is it because you don't have something or some things, plural? Or, or could it be that maybe your relationship with God isn't what it ought to be? All I am convinced that all any human being wants is to be happy and content. And so we ask ourselves here, what moves us to being content? David tells us in Psalm 63, 3. Your steadfast love is better than life. Knowing that God loves you is better than life. There is something spiritually awesome about really understanding and embracing that God loves you in spite of who you know you are. And you want to know who you really are? Because who we really are is what we do when we think no one is looking. Hmm. But God loves us anyway, doesn't he? David tells us in Psalm 63, 3, God's steadfast love is better than life. Paul writes that this way. It comes from Philippians 3, 7 through 10, a very familiar passage. 
says, Paul writes, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. What he's saying is, is that if you put whatever on one hand and you put Christ in this hand, I'm going to turn this stuff down every time for Christ. I don't care what it is. I don't care how much it is. Christ is more important. He says, indeed, I count everything lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as barnyard dung. That's what the word actually means in Greek. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings. Wow. Hmm. Let's, let's leave that one alone. I don't like that one, y'all. It's not fun. Let's, let's skip over that one and go to the next one. Let's be like some other preachers on TV. Becoming like him in his death. You know what that means? He, wants, he knows that real joy, peace, and contentment comes with complete surrendering to God. Knowing and experiencing the steadfast love of God from Psalm 63, 3 means having Paul's attitude in Philippians chapter 3. I have a little handy-dandy computer Bible that can find verses real quick. Let me give you a few about the contentment that the love of God brings. Let me just give you a few. 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Paul writes, For the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. But when I am weak, finish it. Do you know it? Mm -hmm. Then I'm strong. Philippians 4.11, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. 1 Timothy 6.8, if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Let me ask you a question. What does a watch do? Bottom line, keeps time. What does a $12,000 watch do? What does an Apple watch do? What does a Timex watch do? Why do we want, and I've got, Siri talks to me, y'all heard her. Why do we want these other things? What is a car for? What's a car for? To get you from point A to point B. That's all it's for. Now, some people would prefer to go there in style. That's cool. But it's still A to B. Some people can't afford the stylus. I'll never forget the first time I saw a car that had windshield wipers on its headlights. Wow. We need a perspective of what brings, what's the word he uses? Contentment. Keep your life free from the love of money. This is Hebrews 13, 5. It'll, it'll ring a bell here in just a moment. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Except at Christmas and anniversaries. And when I see stuff I want, no, I ain't what it says. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For Jesus has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. Psalm 63, his love is better than life. <coughs> God's steadfast love is not based on our thoughts or words or deeds. It is forever tied to the love of Christ when he died on the cross for us. And nothing Christians can do will ever change God's love. Can I get an amen? amen? The supreme act of love in the history of mankind is the death of Jesus on the cross. And that is how we know God loves us. And it will never change. Can anything shake godly contentment? What if Kamala is president? 
our triple digit inflation, national and world immorality, loss of physical health, loss of family and friends, global war, loss of career and financial security. Can any or all of those things have the result of us losing godly contentment? Hmm? You know you're right now you're supposed to say no. It's like that little kid in vacation Bible school. Have I told y'all this story? That the, the teacher uh, uh, was, was asking a question and uh, she said, what is gray, uh, lives in trees, eats nuts, and has a bushy tail? A little boy raised his hand and, he, and she said, yes, uh, Timmy, what, who, what is that? He said, well, I, I know the name, I know the word, the answer is Jesus, but it sounds a lot like a squirrel. <laughs> You know, sometimes when we're in church, we know the answers we're supposed to give, don't we? But then the Holy Spirit goes, eh, let's, let's think through that a little more. He may have moved on, but I'm going to keep that here with you. Can anything change God's, God's steadfast love, which means our faults, our failures, or our sins? And the answer is no. In fact, knowing God's love for us draws us to him. And brings us to repentance. And one of the things that wounds my heart the deepest, aside from God, is when I have said or done something to wound my wife. That that hurts deep here. Because I know how much she loves me. Look at Psalm 63. I want us to read uh, a few more verses here. And this comes right after David writes, your love, your steadfast love is better than life. Then he writes this, so, in other words, therefore, so I will bless you as long as I, as you, as I live. In your name, I'll lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. I like the way David wrote that. He is talking about Thanksgiving dinner with steak instead of turkey. He is talking about the best that he is. My soul, he says, my soul will be satisfied as with rich fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. That's what it's about, guys. It's not about going through the motions that it's Sunday, so I guess we need to go to worship. You get to go to worship. You get to sing. You get to give. You get to read the scriptures. You and I are blessed to be able to encounter God through the Holy Spirit himself in a little bitty building in the backwoods of Northwest Alabama. Amen. How cool is that? You know what's even cooler? It's when you go to bed at night and you encounter God there. That's what he's talking about right here. You know, in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. Guys, we, we have the greatest blessing. And, and what I wanted to do this morning from this psalm is to show us just how awesome it is for a little while and to not take it for granted. I was talking to one guy this week that I, I consider to be a fairly wise, uh, insightful theologian uh, and preacher of the gospel. And he, with a very true heart, he says, Ron, you keep preaching the way you preach now and you live for 10 years, the day is going to come when you will be in prison. Ask if you knew a lawyer. <laughs> um, that may be where we're heading. I don't know. But you know what? Do you remember when Paul was chained between two guards with a very real probability that his head was going to be chopped off, and he said, to live is Christ, to die, to die is gain. Wow. Are we there? Are we ready? Are we ready to punch our ticket? Do we look forward to when the sun rises in the east? 
for the sound of a trumpet and to be with Christ. Paul said, man, you know, this world's great, but I'd rather be with Jesus. And I'm telling you, that's where I live. Um, I don't particularly like to think about the process that will result in me getting there, but hey, you know, we, we have a good God. But, but I want us to take Psalm 63, and as we go home this week, let's read it a few times. Slow. And let's, let's, let's find out if we are where David is, was. And, and let's, let's, let's gain more towards Christ because that's where joy is and contentment. Let's pray. God, help us in our frailties and in our humanity and in our weakness to really grasp what Paul was saying here or not, excuse me, what David was writing here, that we may seek you and know you because of what you've done in an undeserving manner from us. We don't deserve it, but you have granted us life. And so, Father, may we exalt in you and praise you and worship you and, and follow you wherever you may lead and trust you in all things. And so we praise you even now in our hearts. For it's Christ's name I pray. Amen. Joel. Sure.